So um, Philip left his prop on the stage. Uh, it's a hard act to follow. Um, in particular, I should warn you in advance, I'm a social scientist, and as those of you who studied social science will remember, we are quite boring. Um, and I have no props, um, so um, I'll try to shed my professional identity, if you will, and um, leave behind some of the technicalities of the work that I've done on how American campaigns uh, it, have re-engaged with what in the U.S. is called ground wars. Um, as was suggested, the metaphor works less well, perhaps, um, in many European countries than it does in the U.S., um, but it's seen simply in, in contrast to what's called the air war of television, primarily, and advertising. Um, so I'll leave behind the technicalities and tell you a story about this resurgence, if you will. And we can start this story um, with a number, um, which is the number of people who in the run-up to the 2012 election was contacted in person, either at the door or over the phone, by people who represented uh, the two major parties and the two uh, candidates uh, contesting that office. And that number is about 100 million Americans. Millions of volunteers were mobilized to contact these people. Tens of thousands of people worked for uh, close to the minimum wage to engage in that. It's incredibly labor intensive. Those of you who have gone door to door for parties will know that this takes time. And of course, thousands of staffers were, were involved in organizing this work, as Philip has also suggested in his uh, talk. Um, one can't assume that simply by getting people involved, things will also happen. It is resource intensive and it takes a real commitment to make this work. Um, now, in a way, um, a knock on the door, not working, no? Here we go. A knock on the door um, or uh, a call on the phone seems sort of curiously quaint and old fashioned ways of communicating about politics in a time of um, an ever growing number of television channels, of uh, and a pr proliferation of social media. Um, and ever more sophisticated ways of communicating um, with voters about politics. If there's one central thing that is the takeaway from, from my work and from the story I'll tell you today, that that is not the way that we should think about ground wars, about canvassing door to door or phone banking to call voters at home. Um, personalized political communication, the person to person conversation about politics, is absolutely integral to how competitive well-funded and well-run campaigns organized today in America. They're planned with the same care and effort as the media buys are. They require real investments of staff hours, money, and in the construction of technologies, my Barack Obama being one example of it, but also the databases that lie behind it, as Philip said too. There's some data you can buy, but there's also data you have to collect, store, make useful, so you don't just have it, but that you can act on it. So, Ground wars are integral to how American campaigns are fought today, and they are uh, as cutting edge, contemporary, modern, if you will, as more um, uh, mediated forms of communication like television. They're also, at least in my um, field of the social sciences, largely absent for how we talk about political communication. There's been a real resurgence, if you will, after Barack Obama, and a real sort of re-emergence of the issue of the ground war in conversations. There's been interest from journalists and whatnot. But if you think about the way in which um, the story of political communication is told, to, we tell it to our students, and also in the way in which journalists tell it to the wider public, the, the dominant narrative, at least in the US, of what political communication is about and how political campaigns are waged is a story that I think we can fairly summarize in three central tenets. One, politics has become professionalized. There is no place for amateurs in the, in the, in the title of a widely used textbook in the US. Um, two, politics has become mediatized. Political communication is primarily a question of television and secondarily newspapers and their online websites. And, um, Three, um, politics is, in part because of the professionalization and the mediatization, increasingly by invitation only. It is a, it is a game of parties without partisans, wholly professionalized, uh, uh, centralized, a top-down organization, slugging it out in front of an electorate that has largely been reduced to spectators who have no active role in the electoral process beyond casting their vote. This is the story we tell about political communication um, in the academy, but also in journalism in the US. And it's a story that is accurate in many ways. I mean, there has been a real 
increase in the importance of consultants and, uh, and importation, if you will, of, of, of specialized expertise from marketing and elsewhere to, um, to help politicians uh, communicate with the electorate. It's also uh, the case in the US, I mean, most spectacularly this, in this election cycle, last election cycle, that campaigns have become more expensive and spend more and more money on advertising in particular, and television advertising in particular. And it's certainly also the case that the networks of local party organizations and civic associations that historically engaged ordinary Americans to take an active part in the political process as volunteers have withered away and broken down in many locales. So it's not that the dominant narrative is entirely wrong, it is simply, if you will, that there's something missing from it that we see, which is this resurgence of ground wars that I'll speak about today. It's um, a change in the thinking of those who run campaigns. This is just one example of David Plouffe, who was the campaign manager for Barack Obama in 2008 and was a senior advisor in 2012 again, who talks about the way in which the campaign thought about their volunteer engagement, not as a form of sort of textbook civic, um, civic textbook um, political participation as a value in itself, but as an instrument for reaching out to the electorate on par with other instruments, other forms of communication. This is not simply a change in the thinking of political operatives in the US, it's also a change in how they design organizations, plan budgets, execute those plans. The, um, really, I mean, we, we, we tend to forget we can learn things from losing campaigns. I mean, few people study the Al Gore campaign in 2000 with the same care and attention that they study the uh, Obama campaign within 2008, but really we should think about this um, as something that starts much before the Obama campaign. In 2000, Donna Brazil and the Al Gore campaign, very, very importantly, in 2004 with, the, uh, with Karl Rove's uh, re-election campaign on behalf of George W. Bush, in which Karl Rove and Ken Millman, who ran that campaign, um, increased the budget for volunteer mobilization and, uh, and canvassing and personalized contacts to voters fivefold, fivefold within one election cycle. And of course, it's in general, it, it reflects, if you will, an increased emphasis on running campaigns in the US not as these entirely professionalized, top-down, controlled, closed systems in Philip's um, vocabulary, if you will, but as more open organizations that are permeable and allow the people who want to take part to do exactly that and give them concrete, actionable tasks that are manageable within their everyday life and puts it to use. Not because it's a, a value in itself, which it might be, but because they think it works. Now, again, the 2008 Obama campaign is the most well-known example of this. It's probably what you all think of when we think of canvassing in the US and this resurgence, if you will. But it's important to keep in mind this started well before that. It's the case in the 90s with the Clinton campaigns being the um, clearest example of the focus on the war room and the centralized communication effort that there was no real interest in volunteers at the time. Allegedly, the Clinton campaign would send away people who wanted to volunteer, who came to the campaign offices because they didn't know what to do with them. They had no structure that allowed for people to take part. That's not the situation today where all campaigns, not just the presidential ones, but all competitive campaigns in the US in electoral politics are clamoring for volunteer help because they need their help. They need their help to contact voters in a personalized fashion and we can see how effective they've been at mobilizing more people, making better use of them and reaching larger, um, larger numbers of voters if we look at the development in how many people have been contacted. This is a data series that goes back to the early post-war years of the number of Americans who report in surveys after the election that they've been contacted in person by someone representing one of the major parties. And in contrast to sort of classical narratives of decline, actually it's pretty constant for the first 40 years after the war. It's about 25%, there's some fluctuation, yes. And then something extraordinary happens in, the, uh, in 2000 first with Donna Brazil uh, and the Al Gore campaign. Um, and then really it takes off in 2004. Interestingly, by the way, more people were contacted in person in 2004. We tend to forget what an amazing campaign organization, the Bush-Cheney re-election campaign was in 2004. And the slight decline in 2008 where the McCain campaign couldn't mobilize the same kind of volunteer enthusiasm as Bush did in 2004. We don't have um, comparable numbers for 2012 yet. Um, because these surveys are slow. As I said, we are boring. We're also slow in my business. Um, <laughs> but we do have some numbers of how many people reported even before the election that they've been contacted in person by the two campaigns. 42%. 
even before the last four days of the election, 42% of the American electorate reported that they had been contacted in person by someone representing the two, one of the two major campaigns. The Obama campaign itself, that entity alone, reported 125 million voter contacts at the door or over the phone. And now, to put this into perspective, it's not a like-for-like -like comparison, but it's worthwhile thinking about, well, you know, okay, 42, that's, you know, that 42%, that's a lot compared to what? 125 million, that's a lot compared to what? Um, if we think about where the percentage of Americans who report that they follow the campaign using news media, that's, that's a benchmark we can use in terms of the scale and scope, if you will, these efforts. And I'll give you the numbers. 41% of the American population report that they follow campaign news on television. 32% report they, um, uh, sorry, 36% uh, report that they use uh, online websites uh, to follow uh, the campaign. And 23% report that they use newspapers. So there's no source of campaign news that has a wider reach, that reach more Americans <coughs> than person-to-person -person communication on behalf of the campaigns. This is the, the single most widely um, used, if you will, or the, the single form of political communication that has the widest reach in the US. Now, why is that? I mean, why is it that we've seen this extraordinary resurgence in the same period that we've seen the proliferation of new media, explosion in the number of television channels, social media, internet, you know the story. Why is that? Why do campaigns knock on doors in the US? Are they grassroots romantics? No, it's about winning. If they're completely instrumental in their approach to this. They've turned to, ground war, to the ground war because they think that canvassing and phone banking can help their candidates get elected. They've rediscovered the power of what I call personalized political communication, the use of people as media, as suggested in the Plouf quote. You may not think it, but these two gentlemen are at the cutting edge of where political communication is at today in the US. Why is this? Well, in the 90s, political campaigns were not interested in this in the US, and now they are. Why do we see this change? Well, it's about technology in part. I mean, Philip raised some of the issues. We've seen the emergence of, of campaign websites that help campaigns organize uh, and mobilize volunteers. We have social media via which you can reach out. You have databases that allow for more precise targeting. But of course, the availability of these technologies does not explain why campaigns have invested in them or why they, uh, they dedicate the organizational resources to make use of them. There's something more at play, and we can see this, of course, most clearly because we haven't seen the same kind of resurgence in Europe, at least not yet, where most of these technologies are also available. It has to do, in my view, with two things in the, that are this particular, one that's particular to the US and one that is more general. One is the political environment that American campaigns find themselves in at this particular juncture, which is a situation in which we in the US have a combination of very low turnout. In 96, it was down to 50%, and very high levels of partisan polarization. So very few swing voters, very few voters who genuinely doubt whether they will vote for one party or another. Most Americans either won't vote or they know who they will vote for if they vote. In this particular environment of low turnout and high levels of polarization, of course, mobilization becomes incredibly important because there are more votes to be gained from making sure that those of your supporters who might conceivably stay on the couch on election day or not send in their ballot get out and vote than there is from channeling ever more resources into battling for the shrinking number of genuine swing voters. In both uh, 2004, um, and again, actually, this year in 2012, the estimate was that as little as 7% of the American electorate are genuine swing voters, people who could conceivably vote one way or the other, as little as 7%. So, of course, you know, that's, it's very hard to decide an election by battling for those 7%. There's much more to be gained by turning out your supporters. That's a particular American situation, very different from what we see in most of Europe. But the other side of the resurgence of the ground war, the rationale, if you will, the situation that motivated political consultants to move this direction is more general and not specific to the US. And that's about communications, if you will. It's a situation that campaigns find themselves in. It's a situation where they face problems like oversaturation. The sort of figure that's bandied around in American bargaining circles is that the average American is subject to about 2,000 persuasion attempts every day by advertisers, marketers, and other people trying to influence their behavior. So of course you have a problem. How do you cut through the clutter if you're one of those 2,000? And knock on the door is one way. That's not uh, the most widely used form of communication. You have problems like audience fragmentation. As I suggested, most Americans don't follow the news. 
I mean, how do you reach people through spin and control of the news narrative if most people don't watch the news? And by the way, if those people who watch the news are those who have already made up their mind? How do you reach those who may stay home on the couch or those who are genuine swing voters if they don't watch the news? You need to move beyond the problem of audience fragmentation. And of course, the demonstrably limited effect, a well-known problem. I mean, it is hard to influence for people's political behavior. In contrast to this, the ground wars offer unique contacts. Not many organizations go door to door and, and contact people in this fashion. They offer individual targets. You're not using a shotgun approach. You are using a sniper rifle. You choose individual targets on the basis of the databases that you have. And measurable effects. Philip gave some of the figures. I mean, we know from a a growing number of studies that this works in terms of increasing turnout, but also in terms of persuading people to vote differently when you target swing voters. Now, as said, I'll, I'll leave out, if you will, the, um, some of the science um, and, and just give you a sense, if you will, of the texture of it. I mean, my, my work is, is focused on how this is done in practice by American campaigns. Again, those of you who have worked in politics or volunteered in politics will know, well, it's a lot easier to say that this is done and that it matters than to actually do it. Contacting um, 100 million Americans in person is, is a, you know, quite a staggering logistical challenge. How do you actually pull that off? And that's a story that I've, I've told in a book that I've written about this with the same title, Ground Wars, where I deal with different aspects of these practical challenges and how they're solved on the ground by the campaigns, the difficulties that emerge. And I'll give just, if you will, one slice of that to, to take you behind the story of the resurgence and also show a little bit of the complications, of course, that American campaigns experience when they try to work with this. Um, I'm going to take you from Vienna to the place where I did most of my research um, New Jersey in the U.S. I didn't look at the Barack Obama campaign primarily because, as I always tell uh, European politicians and political consultants when they ask what they can learn from the Barack Obama campaign, first thing you have to know is that you are not Barack Obama. Um, <laughs> you are not going to have a billion dollars. <laughs> um, so, you know, we might actually be able to learn more sometimes, at least for slightly more modest uh, campaigns than these uh, presidential juggernauts. I looked at congressional races. Uh, I looked at Jim Himes in Connecticut. I looked at Linda Stander in New Jersey. There are, there are smaller places. I'm going to take you to Fanwood, New Jersey, where uh, the Linda Stander campaign had their campaign uh, headquarters and were uh, working with volunteers to reach out to voters in this district. And you, sh you need to know here that the district that we're talking about, the 7th District in New Jersey, is a historically a swing district that has elected moderate Republicans. It has been contested in the last few elections, close races. It's very wealthy. It's one of the wealthiest in the U.S. It's a commuter uh, district with people wor working in pharmaceutical companies in, in, on Wall Street in New, New York, commuting into the city from, from New Jersey. So it's a wealthy, affluent, moderate, historically Republican district in which Linda Stender, this Democrat, is running to try to capture that seat. And now we go to Fanwood, New Jersey, and see how um, one of the challenges, if you will, that the campaigns run into as they try to use volunteers as part of that effort to win that district. This is in Fanwood, New Jersey, the, the, um, the campaign office. I'm sitting there in the volunteer room with, um, with the volunteers on the phones talking to, to voters. And Paula, who's one of the regulars who come in um, pretty much every day, she's a retired school teacher, finally gets through to someone. Um, and he starts reading the, she starts reading the script to him that, that she has been given by the campaign. But of course, um, it turns out this man is, is leaning towards uh, voting for the Republican state senator, Leonard Lanz, is running for the seat also. And of course, Paula is a, is a volunteer. She's ideologically motivated. She's a hardcore Democrat. And she gets into an argument with this man. Um, I can't believe you want to vote for a Republican after what Bush has done to our country, thrashed us into a criminal war for oil, undermined the Constitution, handed over billions in tax cuts to the wealthiest. Now. I don't need to tell you that this is not the script that Paula has been given to appeal to a moderate Republican in a, one of the most affluent uh, areas of the US. But of course, she has her own motivations. She has her own reasons for being there. She's not under managerial control by the campaign. And also importantly, she hasn't been trained. She hasn't been um, told, if you will, how to deal with this situation. And she hasn't been persuaded, if you will, that she needs to approach this in a different way if she wants to advance the goals of the campaign. It's just, if you will, to give you an example of take you under the hood and look at the mechanics of how this works in practice, that of course there, people are difficult. I mean, personalized political communications premised on mobilizing very large numbers of people 
to volunteer or to work for modest salaries to contact voters on your behalf. But that's no simple task. You need to train them, you need to work with them in terms of how they're supposed to handle those conversations, what they should come equipped with. This is just an example of a volunteer. The volunteers know something about politics. When you do this with people who work for minimum, minimum wage, they may not even know anything about politics. And you can imagine how those conversations go. I would go canvassing in Bridgeport in Connecticut with a woman I call Charlene in the book, who kept referring to the Democratic candidate for Congress as the Democratic congregational candidate, as the candidate for a church council rather than for the US House of Representatives. And you can imagine, if you are the voter at the receiving end of that contact, are you really, I mean, really going to take that seriously, that someone comes and interrupts your dinner to talk about politics and do not know what the candidate he or she is representing is running for? So there are many, many practical challenges, of course, and that the, the, the devil here really is in the detail of pulling this off. And that is where we might still learn something from the Obama campaign, even though we are not Barack Obama, even though we do not have a billion dollars. That's why I talk about ground wars rather than ground war. There's no one way in which this is done. There are practical challenges that are contextual, different from country to country, district to district, organization to organization that are handled in different ways. But what you can be sure of, at least in the US, is that in all competitive elections, whether uh, you find yourself in the um, privileged position of being this guy, uh, Barack Obama speaking in, in Denver uh, when he accepted his nomination in 2008, um, 65,000 people in the stadium, or this guy, Mitt Romney, uh, speaking at, at an equal-sized stadium in Detroit, not inspiring quite the same enthusiasm, uh, and not being able to manage the visuals, uh, by the way, from this event, they'll be interested in these people. They will need volunteers. Because campaigns increasingly need in the US to work with personalized political communication, person-to-person -person contact at the door, over the phone, to cut through the clutter, to circumvent the media narrative and the audience fragmentation and the limited effects we know of traditional television advertising spin of the news story and reach out to voters one at a time individually to try to motivate them to turn out and vote on behalf of beliefs they already had or to persuade the swing voters that this election is important, that this candidate is the right one for you. And to do it, they need people. You never get enough volunteers. It is incredibly labor intensive. We know the volunteers are more persuasive um, at least if they are trained, more than Paula was, um, than minimum wage uh, casual laborers. So they need people. They need to get them involved. What does it mean? What does this mean for how we think about political communication in the US, at least? Well, I'd highlight three things in particular. And we, in a way, we can go back to the dominant narrative, the idea of professionalization, the mediatization of campaigns, and the sort of the politics by invitation only, the breakdown of local involvement the 90s situation, if you will. Well, first, it challenged how we understand political organizations. Um, they are professionalized at the top, and they do rely on specialized expertise. Many of the people in this room represent such expertise. But they are also, in the US, when they want to engage in ground wars, deeply dependent on mobilizing volunteers. You cannot do it alone. You can't pay enough people to contact 100 million voters. It's not feasible. You need volunteers, and they are also better than the people you can buy. Second, it challenge how we understand political communication, most importantly, of course, by reminding us that something as seemingly old-fashioned as knocking on doors is actually integral to how 21st century campaigns are fought in competitive, well-run, well-financed elections, but also in terms of the consequences of it, if you will. I mean, the idea in the 90s was that mediated communication reduced turnout and repressed political engagement because they leave people cynical and detached. They are spectators. But Personalized political communication, as said, is premised on people getting involved and is also oriented towards, at least in the US situation of low turnout, of mobilizing people, getting them out to vote. So we have new forms of political communication that are instrumental and pursued and instrumental with the instrumental objectives by politicians who want to get elected, but also has the unintentional, essentially, by effect of getting people involved in the process again and increasing turnout. Finally, of course, this then has consequences of how we think about political participation. It is true. We do not have the kind of rich texture of civic associations that used to animate American democracy. And they were not, they're not coming back. We live in a different world. But what we do see is that competitive, self-interested, well-funded, professionally run campaigns are moving away from the closed system thinking that Philip was talking about towards more permeable organizational forms that allow those people who want to take part to do so. 
and engage in meaningful, measurably effective forms of political campaigning that bring out more people to vote and help influence electoral outcomes. It's not a form of political participation that should be romanticized. I mean, it's wholly instrumental. It's about winning. It's not necessarily particularly pleasant. I mean, you go knock on doors, you talk to people who may not be that interested. It's pretty, it can be quite tedious, it can be quite stressful. But what it is, and this is worth bearing in mind, is that it's a form of political communication that aligns the self-interests of political elites who want to win elections with the self-interests of the remaining minority of engaged citizens who want to take part but have had a hard time finding ways of doing so and allow a practical, concrete form of engagement that is available in competitive elections, that is measurably effective, and that is now encouraged in campaigns who take this seriously as a necessary and integral part of how they win elections in the US. And with that, thank you.